of all these interest rate hikes. MPs are here to debate that tonight. Rachel Van Dyen is the parliamentary secretary to the associate finance minister. Andrew Scheer is the conservative's house leader. And Daniel Blakey is the NDP's finance critic. Hi, everybody. Thank you very much for making the time for this discussion. Uh, Ms. Van Dyne, I'll start with you. We just heard Amanda describe that this might not even be the worst of the pain that Canadians are feeling. How is your government prepared to help people who tonight may not be able to make their mortgage payment? Well, I just want to start off by acknowledging that, you know, people in my community and families really right across Canada, um, particularly those uh, with variable mortgage rates, um, you know, are, are feeling really, um, really stretched right now. And, uh, and I know uh, that it is important uh, for them that we continue to be fiscally responsible and to do everything we can in order um, to make sure that Canada um, has a soft landing from this global inflationary spiral we're experiencing. Obviously the Bank of Canada is going to do what it needs to do in order to bring inflation down um, and I saw uh, the decision of the Bank of Canada today of course um, but I would like to you know just remind Canadians that we still have the best balance sheet um, of all of our uh, allies, that we still have the lowest debt, the lowest deficit of what all G7 countries. What does that mean to an individual who tonight cannot make their mortgage payment? With all due respect, I understand those fundamentals of the economy. But when you and the finance minister continue telling Canadians it's worse in other places, even though they are carrying the most debt in the G7 and are worried about defaulting on their mortgage, how does that address their concerns? Well, because we've seen inflation decrease in Canada from a high of 8.1% to 4.4% now, and the Bank of Canada repeated today that it will come down to 3% this summer. And so I think Canadians should, um, you know, take stock as well of that news because it is good news. Inflation will continue to decrease. Um, and we have a number of measures in, um, in the budget that is currently before the House of Commons um, that will continue to support Canadians. Um, whether it is um, supporting tradespeople through um, tax credits for their tools, whether it's supporting low-income Canadian workers with advanced payments, um, various measures. You know, uh, we just heard about the importance of the housing market um, in order, you know, to, to tackle inflation. And um, we have an anti-flipping tax in um, the Budget Implementation Act, which will help curb speculation in the housing market. But the Conservatives are blocking the passage of that bill, as I said, which contains important measures so, to support Canadians. So look, I understand the Conservatives deserve scrutiny for that move, but are you telling Canadians watching tonight that the measures in that bill will allay the, the, the blunt financial pain they're feeling as interest rates continue to hike? Is that what you're saying? If, if this thing is passed, don't worry, you'll be fine financially? Well. I think it's important to be real with Canadians. There is global inflation right now. Um, it is caused by numerous factors. The Bank of Canada um, also reiterated the fact that supply chain disruptions are continuing to um, have an impact. And of course, the war um, that Russia started and uh, that continues to ravage Ukraine. There are um, real concerns that Canadians have about how they will make ends meet and our government is there to support them. I think the alternative is important to point out because the alternative is to cut these programs. The alternative is austerity and quite frankly what we're seeing in the House um, is really problematic and I just want to lay it out for Canadians. We have um, the leader of the Conservative Party state on Monday morning that his priority from now until the end of the session is to block the passage of legislation in the House of Commons. There are 904 amendments to the Budget Implementation Bill, 904 motions to remove 904 clauses of this piece of legislation, 904 more reasons to believe our worst fears about Pierre Polyev and these Conservatives. Okay. He keeps saying that Canada Canada is broken. I disagree with him, but I'm starting to believe that his intention is actually to break it. And, and I'll ask Mr. Sheer about that in a second, but I actually want to start off on another point you made around the concept of austerity, because today your leader, Pierre Polyev, Mr. Sheer, blame the entirety of what the Bank of Canada is doing on government spending. And you said, and he said, pardon me, that a Tory government would, quote, progressively and responsibly balance our budget. Over what period mm -hmm. and cutting how much? Yeah, so it's important to remember that the austerity that Canadians are feeling is because of the Trudeau-driven inflation. 
massive amounts of deficits. The, 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 when, when Justin Trudeau flooded the economy with over $400 billion of brand new cash, not backed up by new production or an increase of output, that is what caused inflation. It's not global. Don't just take my word for it. Look at former Liberal Finance Minister John Manley, who said that what the Trudeau Liberals are doing is like slamming on the uh, gas pedal, while at the same time the Bank of Canada is slamming on the brakes. The Bank of Canada is raising interest rates because the Trudeau deficits are driving up inflation. The time is so critical, Vashi. Many, many Canadians renegotiated their mortgages when Justin Trudeau told them that interest rates would be low for a long, long Long time. They believed him. They went out and they bought homes or they, or they renewed their mortgages and those mortgages are going to come up for renewal in 2025, 2026 and 2027. We must get inflation under control today so that those interest rates can start to come down. Just six months ago, the Trudeau Liberals had a date for a balanced budget and then they blew past it. They, 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 they totally ignored their own advice. Chrystia Freeland herself said increased in, uh, an increase in deficits would be like f pouring inflationary fuel on the fire. So it's government largesse, big, big payouts to liberal fr friendly firms, rewarding their friends with sole source contracts. Okay, that is government largesse that's causing austerity for individual Canadian A couple households. of things to unpack there. First of all, uh, on the citation for Mr. Manley, the former Liberal Finance Minister, I interviewed him the day that you uh, and your party made that pronouncement. And yes, you're right. To a degree, he says government spending has in part contributed to inflation. But he added the very significant caveat that it is not all of it. That there are many other factors exogenous to this country, exogenous to the government's control, that did contribute to inflation, which is why it is a worldwide phenomenon. My it, question it's, it's to you rushing. was, it's, if your party says that you would, unlike the Liberals, decide to balance the budget in a, quote, progressively and responsible way, what exactly does that mean? If you're going to eliminate a $40 billion deficit, are you going to cut child care? Are you going to cut the Canada Child Benefit? Would you not invest in Volkswagen? See, this is, this is the, the, the binary box that the Liberals and their friends in the media try to, to, try to put Conservatives in. Justin Trudeau spent $400 billion and the parliamentary budget officer said during COVID that 40% of that had nothing to do with supporting Canadians. Uh, we can look at the $35 billion Canadian Infrastructure Bank that hasn't got a single project built. We can look at uh, the uh, wage subsidies to profitable businesses who turned around and paid bonuses to their executives. Your There's party lots took and lots that of subsidy, examples. Mr. Yes, sir, sorry, we did not approve giving it to companies that were going to turn around and give it to their CEOs in the form of bonuses. And we've got to stop believing this myth that it's some type of global phenomenon. Like it's like a weather pattern that emerges every once in a while out of the Gulf of Mexico. It's when central banks have to bankroll massive deficit spending at the same time that an economy is contracting. That's what causes crisis. But regardless of your framing, reason, I'm not sorry, saying sorry, they're the only reason of guilt for that. I'm not presenting all, it that way. The only reason why it's happening in other countries is because other countries made the same stupid mistakes that Justin Trudeau made, which is printing money, flooding it through the system, and then turning around and acting puzzled There was that a there's looseness inflation. around fiscal policy in order to buoy the economy because it was flatlined during... And you're right, the PBO did say it wasn't all... Uh, it wasn't all temporary spending. And I have questioned Ms. Mendyan and her colleagues multiple times on that. There is a line of scrutiny there. But it's also fair, I think, for people to ask the Conservatives, if you are going to reverse that, and you do believe it's solely responsible for driving inflation, what are you going to do? The infrastructure bank is not $35 billion in one instance. It's over a long period of time. It does have $9.3 billion, I think, of commitments at this point, right? What you know, what significant amount of spending will you cut, or are you thinking of doing it over 20 years? That's the simple question I'm asking. Well, look, we're, we're, you'll see a fully, uh, uh, you'll see a comprehensive platform when an election is called, where our leader Pierre Polyev will outline his vision for Canadians. All we've said in the meantime is, at the very least, control the, the the rate of government spending. If you want to come forward with a new government program, find a place to save money. If you believe, if you're going to tell me and your viewers that there's no place for the Canadian government to save money, uh, then I don't think you're, you're you're going to find a lot of agreement with Canadian voters. This is a government. I don't that believe that at all. There's all lots of places that you can save money, but can money. you save forty billion dollars? Uh, we, we, we will. We will have a path back to balanced budget, which is essential because that's what that's what is causing inflation. And what's so important for Canadians to realize that what the Liberals are offering is is it's akin to offering a thirsty person a glass of seawater. It looks refreshing. It looks like a cold glass of water. It will have the illusion of giving you relief, but. 
the government will claim to try to offset the impacts of this devastating inflation crisis that they've caused, when all the while that extra borrowing, those bigger deficits, makes inflation worse. So any relief people might feel for a few moments or a few weeks or a few months evaporates as inflation goes up. The proof on that, Vashi, is the month after they tabled their budget, inflation shot up again. That's why these interest rates are happening today. Okay, Mr. Blake, yeah, I want to bring you into the conversation, and, and I want to ask about specific ways that your party proposed the government could increase revenue in order to offset some of their spending. Uh, the government has not acquiesced on any of that, so why do you continue to support it? Well, one of the things, if I could, just to come back to the main conversation on inflation, and I'll come back to this question on uh, revenue. I think it's really important to remember that one of the reasons why the Bank of Canada continues to raise interest rates is because it says unemployment is too low. And we had this conversation, I believe it was on your show, Vashi, about the mandate of the Bank of Canada when it was up for renewal about a year and a half ago. And our position at that time was that the mandate should be expanded, take into consideration things like full employment, so that the Bank of Canada wouldn't be in the position of ruthlessly raising interest rates in the face of inflation to be trying to put Canadians out of a job, which doesn't make a lot of sense, considering that we don't have enough people to fill positions as it is. And so um, part of this goes back to Mr. Paglia advocating very strongly to have a, uh, uh, an intense focus on fighting inflation only by the Bank of Canada. The Liberals gave him what he wanted. I was on a panel with him at the time, and I pointed out that they gave him what he wanted. He threatened legal action against me with all the usual class we've come to expect from Mr. Paglia. So he knew that we were on to something then. And this, is part, this partly helps to explain why our central bank isn't concerned about driving up unemployment at a time when Canadians are trying to pay the bills and when the government but hasn't introduced the reforms to employment insurance that it's talked about for a long time. Now, in respect of the well, revenue... Mr. Blakey, measure, sorry to interrupt. I, I, yeah, I just, I just want to make sure we, I understand here. Do you not concede that the level of government spending does in some way make... The fiscal policy does impact the degree to which the monetary policy lever has to be exercised. It certainly can have an influence. Another thing that has an influence is corporate pricing. And we've seen totally outsized increases in prices that go well, well above and beyond the increase in their input costs. Even the governor of the Bank of Canada finally said as much at the Finance Committee. And I noticed in his comments today, he mentioned pricing uh, as, as one of the problems, which is begin he was a lot, he was very bullish on wage expectations, it's taken him a long time to start talking about the outsized effect of corporate price increases. He's finally getting there. That is a problem that needs to be tackled, and that's not a result of government spending. Now, one thing that government could do to take some of that inflationary capital out of the economy would be to look at sectors like oil and gas that have seen an 1,000% increase in their profits and introduce an excess profit tax, as some other jurisdictions like the United Kingdom have done. That would be a way of taking some of that but money. But that could be passed on to consumers and made it even more painful for Canadians right now. Pardon me? I'm sorry, I missed your question. Sorry, par I, uh, my, pardon me, I, missed I was just saying that that excess tax has been rejected because by the Prime Minister so far because it could, in fact, be passed on. If, if, if corporations are taxed more, they will pass those costs on to consumers. So how does that help Canadians in the long run? Well, that's why I think if you look at the work of Brian Massey, what you'll see is a proposal for um, more of a regulatory structure, not unlike what they already have in Atlantic Canada, where there's some independent third parties that take a look at the pricing structure for oil and gas to make sure that there's fairness there. And because, you know, I mean, whether Canadians are paying it in a carbon tax or some other kind of taxation on the cost of oil and gas, or whether it's just a profit grab by oil and gas companies, that we've seen time and time again. We've seen it a lot in the last two years, but we saw it well before the pandemic. I mean, the May long weekend was an excuse to raise prices on gasoline many times in the past. I think Canadians also deserve some fairness in pricing on the cost of oil and gas and a mechanism to make sure that when governments are trying to ensure that oil and gas companies pay their fair share at a time of record profits, that they don't just pass that that reasonable taxation on to consumers. So there's a discussion okay. to be had. I mean, the Conservatives say they don't like, uh, you know, talking about that kind of regulation, but they do talk about that regulation when they talk about not importing Saudi gas and making sure that Canadian gas can get to Canadian okay. markets. That would actually involve a lot of government invention, okay. intervention in the energy okay. economy. They're happy to talk about it in that context, but not when it's about 
uh, setting fair prices for Canadians uh, when it comes to oil and gas okay. and ensuring that oil and gas companies are paying a fair tax without simply okay, passing consumers. Okay, I'm sorry, I, I pardon the interruption, I'm already literally being told I'm four minutes heavy, and I just want to make sure I circle back, because I think we're, uh, you know, the, the key point from the Conservatives is that you did have a path to balance the budget six months ago. Um, where did it go? Absolutely, and we need to respond to the moment. The Inflation Reduction Act in the United States changed the game for the entire world, and particularly for Canada. We need to continue to be competitive on the world stage. We need to continue to build the economy of tomorrow, because that's where the good-paying jobs will come from for Canadians. And so I understand and appreciate that Andrew Scheer would like to wait until the day before the election to present a plan to Canadians, but Canadians need a plan now, and that's what we but presented in our budget. But you don't have a plan to balance the budget, to be fair. To we have a plan to grow the economy. The plan's not working. <laughs> Mr. Scheer doesn't believe that there is a global economic um, uh, crisis. He does not believe that inflation is a global phenomenon. And he also doesn't believe that climate change is real. So I can understand where, where, where why uh, he is opposing our but budget. Just but put yourself in the shoes of Canadians tonight who hear it's either all the rest of the world's fault or all this government's fault. What is that? Where does that leave people who are struggling in the moment? Well, I, I would like to, to just emphasize that we went through an extraordinarily difficult time during the pandemic and I think every economist agrees that the measures that we put in place and the spending that we did helped Canada come out of that pandemic recession much quicker than had we not spent that money. If we look at the 2008 recession that um, that happened under Stephen Harper's watch, it took nine years for the job market to recover. And we have already recovered from a much lower point okay. from pre-pandemic levels. I apologize. Quick final comment, Mr. Shearer. It, it, it's just not, uh, nothing you said was, was, was true. There are many economists that point to the excessive spending, the wasteful spending, and the corruption that happened during the pandemic. We all remember when Justin Trudeau used the pandemic shamelessly to reward his friend. We just his friends in that the Liberal Party. True. We just found out today that Frank Bayless, a former Liberal MP, got another sole source contract for millions of dollars. So the, the idea that all of the spending was about COVID is false. The parliamentary budget officer of has de fair. debunked it. Well, uh, uh, Tiff Macklin, governor of the Bank of Canada, said that if the deficit had been lower interest rates would be lower because inflation would be lower. If 40% of the spending during the COVID pandemic had nothing to do with COVID, at the very least we could agree that inflation would be 40% less today than it is right now. I'm not sure if and that's when you look, of an equation. When you look, when you look at their plan, they say their plan, their plan is causing inflation to go up and I, interest rates go up today. That's not what today. Daniel Blakey, today. Andrew Scheer, Rachel Mendine, thank you very much. I know it was a lengthy discussion. If there is another interest rate in five weeks, we'll convene again. I appreciate you making the time for it. The front bench is set to dig 